Well, just um, as a, I guess as a way of introduction to the people listening to this, the first time I ever met you was when I was in year 12, it was 2005, and I was at a school camp. I can't even remember the location that it was, but it was Gippsland Grammar, uh, and we, we had what I just assumed was a motivational speaker coming in, and I wasn't ever really into just the motivational kind of stuff, but I met you, and you were up there, and sure, what you were saying was very inspiring, but it was backed up with like a lot of practical steps um, that you were, uh, uh, you know, offering the people that you're working with. And I, I remember leaving there because I was the kind of guy that I was, I was a middle distance runner, very passionate about it, obsessed with the training. I love to put in the hard work with all that kind of stuff and always fascinated by the role that mindset played. And I remember just leaving this camp going, oh my gosh, there's so much more potential for improvement, um, which is above and beyond the running training side of things. Um, that it sort of got me really excited. So I'd been wanting to do a bit of a, a mindset session or a, a mindset podcast just for all the athletes out there who are in the same boat as I was or uh, maybe are still now. And I couldn't think of a better man to do it. But I don't know if you have a memory of, of that camp, Dobbo. It's gone back a long time now. Um, I've got a better beard and I think so do you since mm. since back then. But man, do you remember that camp? Do you remember what it was about or, or where we were at? Um, I don't know. I don't specifically, I, if I knew the venue, I would, I ran so many of those programs and I've actually got a fairly good memory. So if I saw the venue, I'd be able to, I'd be able to quickly bring it back. I, it's funny how everybody's got something they can do. You can probably remember every race you've been in and the different legs. I tend to, if I, I can usually remember, if I see a venue, I can remember the audience. I remember where everybody was sitting. Um, I do know that on that program though, you said that I, I called some guy out because he was just giving us grief. And then I think that's where you said it changed because I stopped being a fluffy person up the front and I, I started swinging punches and everybody realised I wasn't to be trifled with. And it wasn't because I was mean, just that just nobody calls people out and just said, mate, you've been a dick. Like, yeah, just, man, I've, I've got a very good memory of it. We were um, It was actually on your return visit. So you'd at the start of the year, we had the, the school camp and then you actually came out to Gippsland Grammar in sale and ran a yes. session. I remember you running the session in the big auditorium, and I was sitting next to the bloke. His name was Lancey, and um, he was he had a reputation for being a little bit mouthy, a little bit lippy. And I thought, oh, I could see you up the front, and you were you were very focused. But I saw you just keep sort of turning your attention in that direction, and I was thinking, oh no, I've got a feeling Dobbo's going to call him out. And then in front of everyone, he was gone for about half an hour. You go, mate, we're not here to fuck around. And he goes, oh, and I was like, oh. And then he was like, he just went dead quiet and the rest of the room was like, oh, we've got to pay attention now. And it was just, a, it was amazing to watch because I thought, as you say, not many people call people out on their behavior. You just sort of push through and it's awkward and uncomfortable for everyone. But I tell you what, it squashed any troubles that you might have had for the rest of that session and certainly made it memorable for me. I'm talking about it 16 years later. There you go. Well, actually, I had um, so now a lot of my work, although I've helped a lot of athletes achieve some pretty significant things, which has been really enjoyable, a lot of the athlete work has been, uh, for me, it's been a passion, it's been an interest. So I, I was like, you kind of get to test whether or not you're, you're capable. And I like being around people who are really hardcore going for something because it uh, uh, just seems like a good use of time to me. But recently, my work is with executive teams and exa pretty much the same thing that happened on your camp happened recently in the executive <laughs> meeting. I'm in the room with about... Four executives. These guys are all on 400k plus, right? These are, these are no schmucks. And they're all, there's about four or five in the meeting room and about another four online. And two of them were clearly working on their computers online while they were attending to be in this presentation. Or <clears throat> this, there's a dialogue, a meeting. And I just stopped and I just said to these people, let's just call them Tom and Sarah. I said, Tom, Sarah, you both guys look like you're doing something. And I, it's, if you are, that's totally cool. But if I mean, it's coming across as if you are. And uh, they were like, oh, no, 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 we're not focused. Anyway, the CEO came up to me afterwards and he said, oh, my God, Dubbo, the talk of the town is that you just called out the two really senior people. I said, no, people haven't stopped talking about it. And so it was interesting because that's actually the ingredient is the accountability. It's people are sitting in there. But one of the questions I've always got when I'm working with any community is, are you trying to look good or are you trying to be good? And they were trying to look like they were being executives. But I'm like, be an executive and focus or get the hell out of the room because it's not helpful. <laughs> and, and another term I've always found, it, I, I live by, is that people-pleasing is a form of assholery. Like, if, you, if you're pretending that you want to have coffee with me or you're pretending that 
you know, you're interested in what I'm saying. And later on, I find out that's really offensive. So if you're not interested, then get out. And if you are, then get on with it. But, but you know, make a call and stop pretending to everybody because it's not helpful. It's so refreshing, man. I can imagine. I can only imagine how many Zoom calls have been backed up with uh, a lot of seasons of uh, heist or whatever it is that you're watching in the background getting getting through. It uh, it must be confronting for anyone on the other side of that. But it's fun, especially in the running world. I always find I've had a, a couple of really good athletes on the podcast, and there seems to be a correlation between. Um, uh, not in all cases, but there's definitely something noticeable with the athletes that are, are very, very good at what they're doing. They also seem very good at, at just being uh, quite direct. So the former Australian 1500 metre champ or, or record holder, Ryan Gregson's his name, he's very he's very straight to the point. He's very clear. He's very decisive. And I really like it because you feel like you always know where you stand with a person like that. And I've noticed a bit of correlation, whether it was Steve Monaghetti or Lee Troop or Ryan Gregson, is these top Australian athletes, they all seem to have that, all right, I'm going to tell you exactly where I'm at. And I always wonder with things like that, whether it just helps you just jump through a whole lot of fluff and a whole lot of uh, just excess crap that you don't need, uh, you don't sort of need to be fluffing around in. So it, how do people respond when you, are, yeah. when you approach them like that? Because I can imagine it's fairly confronting to be called out on your BS. Well, the... Uh... It's tricky. The senior person that's hired me usually has no issue with it because if you write an email to a senior person or they email you, they are very short and candid. They don't do any of the, hi, how are you going? Hope you had a good time. How was your weekend? It's, it's very uh, it's, it's very focused. It's, it's, and it's not mean. It's clear. And it's candid. Right? It's not honest because people say, oh, yeah, we're really honest. Well, you can't be honest because you can't have honest as a value because you can't. nobody's pro-dishonest. And nobody wants to be dishonest, right? So it's about being candid and we clear. So the senior people never have an issue with it. Sometimes they'll say to me, geez, I've got to go clear that up. But it's really because they weren't having a difficult conversation and I've had it for them. But that being said, what we're talking about is a very small part of, you know, what I bring. And usually there's a lot of value. Um, there, occasionally there are some people that... The thing is that I'm not mean. I'm just... There's a... I have a kindness. So when I'm saying it, I'm not trying to crush anybody. I'm just bringing something to a head that everybody's wondering. And it's actually taking up mental energy. And I pay attention. If I'm using mental energy on this, I'm not using mental energy on the task that I actually want to achieve, and nor is the organization. And uh, and it's very unsettling to when you're working on something significant to be putting your best forward and feel like people aren't paying attention. So, mm. And I think those people that you mentioned, they are – for them to achieve what they're trying to achieve, which is so unbelievably difficult, it's so rare, they cannot, it's like a running technique, it needs to be highly efficient, no excess energy used anywhere, including with communication uh, mm. and focus. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, and some people find it a bit challenging, but generally if somebody wants to achieve something, they're very open, they're quite happy with that kind of conversation. They quite find it quite refreshing. Yeah, it's, it's a really good point. I love the fact that you just mentioned running technique. This is something that we talk about on this podcast quite a lot because it's, it's funny that um, I, I know you've done a work with a, a lot of athletes mm. and we're going to get into that fairly mm. soon. But uh, it's one thing that absolutely does my head in when we're talking about running that a lot of athletes are completely unaware of how important and efficient running technique is. The fact that you, who's not necessarily uh, just tied to athletics, had that little bit of insight but before we even get into this podcast is, is pretty impressive because, man, it's so funny. Like, you look at a sport like swimming, you look at a sport like golf, um, it's, it, it seems obvious, it comes, with the, uh, it comes with the territory that technique's so important. But in the running world, it seems that so many runners uh, don't even, uh, you know, know about the importance of it. So the fact that you've just gone here, you've been here four minutes, you're not necessarily mm. a running coach. You've already got that awareness. It's mm. put us on a pretty good foundation to get started, Dobbo. Mm. <laughs> That's good, man. Yeah, so, I, think, I, think, I, I think on that, just mix, I agree, most people are looking for the one chess move that's easy that's going to help them rather than looking at the one thing that's inconvenient but would actually help. Mm. And changing your running technique is inconvenient. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a really good point. Actually, the example I always give was when I was in about year eight, my teacher was trying to teach me how to touch type, and I'd started getting pretty fast just with my index finger, and I was typing away, typing away, and she said, actually, you know what, in the long run, what I'm about to show you is going to be really effective. And I was like, oh, man, it just felt so clunky. That felt so inefficient. It felt so slow. For whatever reason, I'd seen my mum touch type and thought it looked pretty cool, so I thought, all right, I've got to stick with this. 
I'm so glad I did because that probably six weeks of discomfort just transform, yeah. transformed the way I type. So it's funny when people yeah. mention how it can be like an, a, a short term slowdown period mm. for a long term gain. Mm. It's uh, yeah, it's so true, man. But Dobbo, let's start, let's jump into it, man. I'm I'm really interested because I think when it comes to running, there's there's obviously so many factors that go into a a really solid performance, and and we've talked about technique, and obviously training is a huge part of it. I look at diet and recovery. But one thing that I think a lot of people still, for whatever reason, um, might be aware of but are really unsure how to do anything with is is the mindset. And you, you only have to look at a top athlete, a couple that I mentioned before. All of those athletes, are, they seem incredibly positive, or not even positive necessarily, as much as confident in what they're setting out to do. There's There's none of those names that I mentioned before who stand on a start line and go, oh, I, I guess I might be talented enough. They they seem to genuinely believe it. And I understand that a lot of that can come with talent and the history of mm. solid performance and your confidence is obviously going to improve from that. But but I guess just to throw the ball to you as a, a, a mm. little bit of a laying of the foundation, um, when you go to an athlete mm. and you're sort of just trying to lay the foundation about what it is they want to achieve, what it is they're trying to do, are there some common questions or are there some common standout points that you can see that are either, um, you know, confidence boosting for you as a coach to go, okay, these guys can really make some rapid improvements or, all right, there's some there's some serious walls we're going to have to jump over before your uh, your performance mm. goes to where you're probably capable of going. Okay, so, the, yeah, there are. There's a sort of a pattern, if you like, that I sort of look through um, and... There's actually, well, actually, frankly, there's seven conversations I typically have over and over, and we won't get into all of those right now, but I can give you a solid framework without holding back. The first one is I'm always trying to work out what we're ultimately trying to achieve because that would give me permission to, it puts the parameters on what I have permission to say. So if somebody says that they say want to be, I don't know, super lean, uh, that gives me permission to then, well, we should talk about your diet. But if they don't want to be super lean, then... I don't have permission to talk about that because it wouldn't act, it's not actually relevant. And that's why the example before, the CEO doesn't have issue with me being candid because I found out exactly what he wants or she wants from her organisation. So I live inside the boundaries of what is purely relevant to that. So the first question is vision. So to give you an example, I had a conversation with a, uh, a swimmer, Andrew Lauderstein, a long time ago. And Andrew had won a, uh, a silver medal at the Olympics in uh, backstroke. And He'd been flattened. I think that's on, on the record, so I, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't mind me saying. And so another swimmer that I was advising about Target invited me to, he said, listen, Andrew, I didn't know Andrew at the time. He said, he's a bit flat. Maybe we could have a chat. So we, we go out for cigars and a whiskey. And back then, I didn't do either of those. And it was a bit <laughs> difficult to build the rapport. <laughs> I was coughing away. <laughs> and then and he said, you know, he'd always had this goal of winning a medal at the Olympics. And he did. And I said, yeah, the issue is that you had a goal. And what usually happens with a goal is once you achieve it, you stop. So you get home and you take the bins out, you know, take, you either get home and you sit on the couch and then someone says, take the bins out. And you're like, damn, you got to get up again. And so many people with their fitness and training, they they want to win, you know, an event. And at the end of the event, they don't continue training or they slacken off because they don't have a goal, not a vision. And a vision is what would you do over a long period of time with your sport or with your body, you know, whatever, you know, or the company. And he said, what would that have been then if I had had a vision? And I said, to die an icon of the sport. So then he would have just kept on swimming. But his, his goal was to get a medal, and he got it. And he got it so quickly at such a young age. It threw him. And it takes a while to pick your next goal. So the first thing I'm always looking for is what's the what are we ultimately trying to achieve and can it have some longevity? Uh, there's, the sec, there's a, well, depending on the order of things, but I am I am always trying to check if, is it a skill set issue or is it a mindset issue? Mm. A lot of people, when they think it's a skill issue, or they rather, let's reverse that. If they think it's a mindset issue, it's often a skill issue. And when they think it's a skill issue, it's often a mindset issue. Not every single time. The classic is the golfer who says, oh, I can play 18, oh, I can play nine holes, fantastic. And I'm on the 10th and I spray a shot. And then, you know, I get so angry with myself and then I spray another one and another one and I lose it. So I'll say drop 10 or 20 balls down and say, well, hit them at the pin and say maybe six out of 10 balls land near the pin. I said, no, you see, your skill is a six out of 10 golfer. Mm. The skill becomes an issue. You get mad, but you don't actually have the skill to hit the next shot straight. So it's not a, it's not a mindset issue. 
Now, there's other times when the skill is actually there, and I can usually ask that by, have you ever uh, uh, run this distance before? And I said, yes, I can. Well, the skill's there. You can run that distance in that time frame. So why are we having some doubts? So therefore, it's a mindset discussion. So I'm always trying to check, are we actually dealing with a skill issue or a mindset issue? Mm. Uh, and then, then that chooses the path of what we need to investigate. Yeah, it's a really good point. I love what you were saying about goals versus vision. And there's a example, I was just talking about him in a YouTube video I made the other day because I'm, I'm starting to get excited about the men's 1500 meters in Tokyo. And the reason I mentioned that was because the 2016 Olympic champ uh, in Rio was a guy named Matt Centurits. He went out, <clears throat> wasn't necessarily the favorite though, he's a good, a good chance, went out, won at first American in, I think it was 40 or 50 years that had won the title. And he'd been so consistent for years and years and years. Every time he was on the start line, you'd go, okay, this guy's going to have a good race. He just, he was fit. He was talented. He knew where to place himself. He knew how to finish. It was impressive to watch. And and almost like clockwork, he won the Olympic gold medal, came out the next year and just could not win a race. He, but not even win a race. He, he, he wouldn't even finish in the top five or six just in the US in races that he, he would have just dominated. And um, I think I'd uh, possibly heard you speak about something like that before, though I couldn't have put the goal and vision uh, title on it. And it, it was really interesting just to see such a rapid decline in performance. And I remember wondering, like, how much of this had to do with his Olympic gold medal and feeling as though you've just achieved everything there is to achieve in the sport? What's interesting, though, was the first time in about three and a half years this year, he's come out and started just running pretty well again. He started to to look a little bit more like his, his old self. And I, I think I wonder how much of um, his perspective on what he's trying to achieve is, has changed. Like when you hear about a story like that, I guess that doesn't sound too surprising. You've got Olympics on the horizon. All of a sudden you've come back to form. Um, I, I guess for him that could just be another goal. But the idea of it being something far greater than just one Olympic gold medal, I guess would light up a bit of fire in your belly to get out and start running well again. Yeah, and especially those of us that are not... Uh don't have that goal of say being an Olympian or perhaps you enjoy running and like I'm 48 now and had just had a couple of kids and I don't have the, the time or the body that can run like I used to, but I used to love running. So it was like, you know, two or three times a week it was five, seven K. It was just, it was, I really enjoyed it. And I enjoyed it because I, I felt great. I never actually necessarily was trying to hardly when any, you know, hardly any organized runs at all. Uh, but I enjoyed it. But if you're the kind of person that has gotten fit for a run, then it, it's difficult when there's not one on the horizon to to just to just be active. Mm. You know, or if, if listeners are tuning in now and they find they're going up and down, sometimes it is worth reflecting on what the vision is. So my one now is that I, I, th I don't ask the question what I want to achieve. I ask the question, how do I want to live? So somebody might say, oh, I want to say weigh 80 kilos. Right. Well, you might get to 80 kilos and then you're like, oh, I achieved it. But if I want to live at 80 kilos, that's that's a really different way, a mindset in the way you manage yourself. So for me, with, with my running and my body, I just want to be able to say, yes, if somebody asks me, do I want to play basketball or tennis or, you know, or go for a run? I just want to be able to participate, you know, in a fun enough way. I don't have to be the best, you know, especially my time doesn't allow for it. And so that's I've just chosen how I want to live. Mm -hmm. And some of those that example is before yeah you would have had a goal and you can't it's not even smart to always be at your best because you get tired it takes a lot um so yeah so, so I, I find that vision is really important as a you know i think about lifestyle especially for the people this they've probably got a great range of ability uh and you go through patches where you know it's you can't be your best and you start to feel bad and you start and this is one i always watch for you start to feel like you say start saying to yourself i should you know, oh, yeah, I should get out there again or I should time that or I should sign up for a race. That word should is someone else's uh, agenda. It's not It's not a pure drive. It's not internal. So we need to listen. What, what do we really desire? And if you'd like to sign up for a race or get a coach or, you know, get your diet sorted, then that's a totally different motive. So you're trying to work out, you know, does this, as you choose, is this guy, as you mentioned, he may have just shifted his goals for a while and that's okay. But you're looking for some sort of pure motive. 
Yeah, it's a good point. It's amazing how many times in my own life I'll start doing the, the, the shoulds and I'll look back and think, hang on a second, why am I feeling any joy about this experience I've just had? Mm. And it's because you've just got this constant this constant thing which you, which you should have, could have, would have achieved if you were uh, living by someone else's standards. But one of the things I'd um, be interested to pick your brain about, Dobbo, as well, before, I don't know if I don't want to take us too far off track because I know you said you had se- seven kind of conversations and I'm sure there's a lot of sub points um, beyond what you've just said. But... Uh, when it comes to, I guess, targeting a vision for your life and, and getting beyond, um, you know, just a couple of the goals that you've been setting for yourself, one thing which I've experienced per- personally and also chatted to a number of people who seem to be familiar with what I'm explaining is this idea that, okay, even even if your vision for your life is a little more simple, it's not going to be as um, an elite athlete, which you might have always dreamed of being, a lot of people seem to struggle with the realization that their skill set might not rat match mm. um, the dreams that they had mm. of, say, running at an Olympic Games when they're not talented enough to run at Olympic Games. And yeah. it can be a little bit of a transition period between, okay, so here's my skill set, here's my ability, but this is the dream for my life. And it doesn't look as though I'm going to be able to actually live up to the dream that I've had. That can be quite disheartening for someone to to realize like that realization can strip a bit of motivation and enthusiasm for what it is that they're doing. Like, have you got any tips to, to navigate yeah. that realization? Yeah. yeah, that is brutal. It's a brutal experience to have desperately imagined something and designed it and planned for it and essentially be getting there through no fault of your own. It, it sometimes can be errors that we made. So the way I think about ability is that there's a sliding scale Imagine a left to right scale. And at one end is bloody miserable. And at the other end, there's world class. And everybody has a range on that. So, and, and a range, an academic example is easiest to explain. So in maths, for example, a B might've been a very good grade for me. And A, other people got, and you know, smashing perfect scores and being a genius is world class. I, I was happy when I got a B because it was the best I could deliver on that subject. I didn't even expect to get an A. But if I got a, a, a C or a D, even though people did performed poorer than I did, I was unhappy. So the first thing I'm looking to assess personally or I'm, I pose to people is, have they performed at the maximum of what they're capable of? Because most individuals, high performers and athletes specifically, they're biggest pain is when they didn't do their best Mm. they can almost live with a loss if they say that's the fastest i've ever run you know that's the best presentation i ever did that's the best meeting i ever ran so the 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 first thing is the first question is did you did you perform at the best of what you're capable of now some people say no they didn't and that is to be discussed but some people say yes i did but it still didn't go my way well the next question i ask is did you put yourself in the best position for something to go your way? Because when when we're on the blocks, the starter's gun goes and similar, there there is an element of luck. And I don't presume that I should plan on luck, but if something's gonna go my way, I wanna make sure that I was ready to capitalize Mm -hmm. on that moment. Mm -hmm. So that would be the second question and further, I'd always like to check, do they know what the actual levers are, the actual key activities that would get the outcome? Because sometimes people really think they've done a great job. And this happens a lot in equestrian. There's a lot of, for a long time, I was working with some equestrian riders and I still advise a couple. It's very common in equestrian that they'll do a routine in dressage and then be judged. And then they'll be, the the rider is so furious because they think the judges have got it wrong. They think they've scored them harshly. It's not fair. I'm better than that other person. But when you ask the judges, how do you make a decision? They're very clear about it. But then the rider will often be dismissive. Oh, that's ridiculous. And they won't listen to how it's actually judged. What are the actual levers? And I find many times in life, people have never put the written down the ingredients. This is what I think it would take to deliver a certain time. Mm. And they've never written them down and then put them in front of somebody who truly knew. So if you wrote down your your race plan or one of your uh, listeners did, and they put that in front of Steve Monaghetti and said, this is what I'm going to do, he would be able to give them 
candid, clear advice if that's going to get them the outcome and, and whether or not it's a complete plan. So then I'm always checking, is it a complete plan? Now, if I take that one step further, what if I'm I'm just too short? You know, I just have too short a stride and I wanted to be the best in the world. Then often what I have to point out, and it doesn't mean it's necessarily easy to do, is this person has huge passion, huge talent, huge drive. They pick the wrong target. There'll mm. be another environment where that is perfect. And that doesn't mean that it's easy for that person to let go of. But I even think about my own career. When you're young, you just shoot for the stars. Time, you work out what's best for you. Now, what I've realized is that although there's, I could have had a high profile and I did at one point, I really don't enjoy it. And what I'm really good at is being a very under the radar, high quality facilitator that only really elites access. That at first, in any industry, you'd think, oh, maybe you need to be famous or maybe you need to have, you know, be billing billions of dollars or millions of dollars or build a huge company. I think the other thing that we have in the community is we always talk about 10xing everything as if that's success. You know, oh, you need, you know, gazillion followers. It's like, it's all crap. So it takes a while to mature your clarity. And so that would be the conversation of having someone, can we pick pick a target that, that success is it's almost logical for you there? Um, yeah. Yeah, it's it's truly difficult. I have a lot of athletes go through this. Like they miss out on the Olympics, and it, and there's a lot of pain. Mm. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good point, Dobby. There's a lot of good points in what you just said there. It's, um, I think the most difficult part is is just that realization, isn't it? Just going okay. So the skill set's not quite enough for where it is that I want to run, and and sort of once you move past that particular realization, you can still make massive strides towards like a slightly adjusted goal? Is is that sort of what you're saying? Yeah, I think you're looking... What I'm looking for is what? who do I want to be? Who am I? So when I turn up, if I'm fun, then it doesn't matter if I'm doing stand-up comedy mm-hmm. or if I'm a beers with friends or I'm playing with my daughter, then fun is my brand and how I handle myself. So I'm looking for an identity a way I conduct myself, rather than an outcome. So if somebody considers themselves world-class, and they're world-class in whatever environment they turn up in, now, a world-class performance isn't necessarily meaning victory. We've all seen those person, those people who have got an injury and they still cross a line, and we say that, that has such character and class, we respect it. So victory isn't the only way to be measured. And But I like to have people clear on the their brand and and who they want to be mm. uh, i think that's super helpful in that circumstance and that would yeah. be the conversation i'm typically having with people and the easy way to do that for listeners is just pick two or three words you would like to use to describe yourself it's not how you presently describe yourself you would think about your vision and you would you would you would ponder okay if somebody achieved that it's not me somebody else achieves that what three or four words would i use to describe that person and They may not be words you describe yourself at the moment, but then you would use those two or three words as a decision-making framework. And and I had a conversation recently, so um, as you would know, that like I have advised a lot of swimmers, but I was just leading into these Olympics, I was advising uh, Matt Target. And Matt, after seven years retired, said, called me up and and said, because the Olympics have been pushed back a year, I think I could actually go again. And he's seven years retired. I'm like, whoa, really? Like, that's never <laughs> been done before. Right? And I said, you got one year to do it. I was like, I do. And so he contacted Grant Hackett, who you might be familiar with. Like, in some listeners, if Australian listeners would know Grant, Grant won 58 um, medals on the world stage, 36 gold. You know, he's, he's a, just a freak. So, so Grant and I would advise Matt for 30 minutes every Friday morning, and he would just show us his training plan, what his challenges are, what he's navigating. And we did exactly this at one point where. We're looking at what we're ultimately trying to achieve. And I said to Matt, what three or four words would you, do you think you'd need to be? And I don't remember what they were, but he just jotted three down. And I said, well, let's put it in front of Grant because Grant's done this. And so Grant, you look at those words and he said, well, no, I would be A, B and C. And he offered three other ones, which were completely different for what Matt had on the radar. And it was it was eye-opening for Matt. It wasn't offensive. He's was like, wow, I was looking at it from my view, but I haven't done it. I need someone mm-hmm. who has done it who can tell me. Uh, and Matt missed out by a fraction of a second, like a third of a second, and we didn't we didn't do it. And you know, even now we're asking those questions, like, 
did we put ourselves in the best position for something to go our way? And we actually haven't debriefed it yet at this point, but uh, I'm really proud of Matt. It was a phenomenal effort, and somebody will do it one day. Um, a fraction of a second. Oh we're, just, like, we're just just missed it. it was, After oh, seven years out of the sick. sport. It's funny, isn't it? I guess that comes back down yeah, to perspective because yeah. I hear that and I go, oh, my God, that's a pretty bloody good effort. <laughs> but I guess when you, you try yeah, your goals to make that team, it's a bit more disappointing. And especially tra- training in a private pool in somebody's house. They had a house down because he was living in LA and he could not get to a p- proper full-length pool. Oh. So he's training in a 15-metre pool or something. And then even when he's in hotel quarantine, he got an inflatable bath and just an inflatable pool and just to keep it the feel of the water, just would fill it every day and swim. And in case they took it off him, he had a second one to go. But the lengths that we had to go through during COVID year was madness. To get there was remarkable, but you still... You still want that thing. And, mm. and there's that transition for all of us. That, that you're like, well, who, what are we going to do now? Like, who, who are we? And are we proud of ourselves? And do I just rationalize this so that I feel better about things? Or do I take a hard hit? And which one is appropriate? These are very common human things to go through. They're not just the elite athlete. It's just a bit more tangible when someone's got a very clear goal. Yeah, far out. I just I love that story about the blow up inflatable pool in the hotel quarantine. It's been a tough year for a runner because obviously um, competitions have been mm. cancelled. I can't imagine how hard it's been for a swimmer because you can't even really get to the pool to do your training, oh. like the usual kind of training anyway. Yeah. Oh crazy, my gosh. Crazy time. <clears throat> Dobbo, trying to organise for this podcast. One of the challenges I had was I just and I know you've been talking about it for thirty years or however long it's been now, is trying to navigate. All right, in a one hour conversation. What do you talk about when it comes down to developing a, a I guess, a, for lack of a better phrase, a, a better mindset for performance? Mm. And the thing that I'm interested in, and it's hard to give you a real black and white definition on exactly like who the audience is. I've heard from from quite a few. Mm. Um, it's most mostly an Australian audience. Some are in the US, some are in New Zealand, some are in the UK. They're sort of the top four locations who listen to the podcast. From what I can tell, a fairly even divide between men and women, give or take a little bit, but I don't know how accurate all those stats are. One of the things, oh, and the the last thing was uh, also, I've got some athletes who listen and they're Olympians, and I've got some athletes who listen and they started six months ago because they wanted to get fit during COVID, but they've just started to really enjoy it and are thinking about running their first marathon. So trying to cater for all of these different people, and I, I know we can't just give like a, a one-size-fits-all sure. approach to how to develop a great mindset for whatever it is that you're yes. trying to do. One of the things I struggled with was knowing how to ask the question about what do we focus on today? Because um, sure, there's some universal things that we can do that make us more positive in our life, but I'm not sure whether there's a one-size-fits-all a, a approach just to perform, uh, improving your performance, which we've sort of, I, I guess, maybe established a little bit um, in yep. the early parts of this podcast. But um, right. if you were sitting down to a, an audience of people, a room full of people who they sort of fit the description that I've just given you and you are asked just to give a couple of real tangible takeaways yep. to make some practical steps forward towards your vision, but where do you start with that, Dobbo? What are the things that you you look at? What are the things that you are trying to sure. break down and, and sort of crack open for these guys to be able to go, okay, like me in year 12, I took away a whole heap of tangibles and started to apply it. Um, okay. are, there, are there a few key areas that you focus on to begin? Yes, for sure. One of the important things is to recognize what a really elite mental, uh, elite mindset is. Mm. And it, because often people think that you need to be invincible and confident. If my athlete is confident, that worries me. So what I'm actually after is a reverence for the task at hand. Mm. So, and now that's all, you're allowed to be nervous. You know, this is a difficult thing you're about to do. So don't feel like you have to suppress that or think that that is a sign that you cannot deliver. So step one, we want a reverence for the task at hand. So we turn up and we are respectful and we're not blase. We're like, this needs my significant attention. Secondly, confidence is the result of ability. You know that you can do a squat. You know that you can run 100 meters. You know that you can stretch. So when there is that reverence for the task at hand, it's a difficult thing. The confidence is not in the outcome. The confidence is that you you know what you can do. 
our confidence drops if we start to strive or we have a, a goal where there's a disconnect. We can't see how our, our present ability achieves that. That's when a self-doubt comes in. Now, it's okay to have doubt. Yet most of the time, if you've done the work, you don't have a mindset issue later because you know that you can do that thing. So if I said to you, Tyson, can you go for a run? You can do you know, one kilometre right now. You're like, yeah, of course. There is no mindset issue whatsoever. Now, when we're starting to push our ability, we get to a point where we're starting to set objectives that might be just outside our skill set. So there's a there can be a confidence issue. But once again, I try to work out what skill is missing. And if I address that skill, then I have a, don't have a mindset issue. There is a difference when people are on the, at the starting line and they're not comfortable with pressure. Some people step up with pressure. They love it. They don't perform at their best until they're in a race, until some, some adrenaline kicks in. But there are many people that don't respond well to pressure. They go blank. It's as simple as when the waiter comes across and asks them what their order is. Uh, they just can't think. And so my wife would fit in that category. She will always <laughs> to read the menu before we get there because she doesn't have pressure. It's not that she can't order, but she, before, she, she orders the right <laughs> thing, the best thing, you should advance, right? Yeah. So if you're the kind of person that doesn't like pressure, often people will have a drink the night before to say they've got some sort of excuse of why they underperformed or they're like, oh, I just turned up last minute. And that's fine. But better, design an entire career. How many uh, PVs you might want to get over the period of 15 years? Or how many events you want to get or medals or times or times you want to smash it? How many occasions you want to smash a certain time? And have a lot, have a, and that way it gives you've got 15 years. We're going to be races are in that time, and every one of those is a chance to do it. So the longer you've got a career, the more chances you have, and the less pressure there is. So, yeah, if someone That's doesn't like pressure, point. I'm like design, design a career, and have a, what I call a champion psychology, where you win a lot over a long period of time, mm -hmm. rather than a hero psychology. If you're a, if you love pressure, then have a hero. I'm going to win this event, and don't even think about the rest. That's a great. That's a great point, Dobbo. That's an awesome time, point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if it makes sense, right? It's a completely different game plan. So I had an athlete years ago. You know, had this problem. I just kept on losing, and they were easily fit enough. I could tell it wasn't a skill issue. And I said, look, let's work out what you want to achieve over ten years. We did. We worked out there was about uh, there must have been about thirty events a year. Um, so this and for the particular sport. And that meant over 10 years, is 300 events. I'm like, well, how many would you have to win or medal in to be considered a champion? He said, oh, probably 10 to 15. I said, of 300, <laughs> it's easy. That is a so, really good point. Right, right. So he he wins the next event the next weekend. He didn't pay me a cent. It was just a passing conversation over a drink at a, you know, after a conference. So it was very, it was as easy advice as this is. So he calls me up the next weekend, tracks down my phone number, which other people don't do that, right? But anyway, <laughs> tracks down my phone number, calls me up. He's like, oh, my God, it was amazing. And, and I said to him, whatever, mate, call me in 15 years. And I just hung up because I'm like, he went to a hero psychology of celebration. I'm like, well, don't start measuring yourself by a hero. You've been a hero champion. Commit. And so, you know, he contacted me four or five years later and he continued. And I was like, now I respect you. The I love it, man. I love it. So I didn't know if I was about to cut you off there. So I was just pausing awkwardly for a moment. Did you? Were you about to say anything else, Dobbo? It's hard sometimes no, with okay. Zoom because I, I don't know if it's a lag or no. whether uh, whether the points finished. So I don't want to cut you off if you if you got no, more no. to say. But man, I can almost feel a weight lifted off my shoulders on behalf of these people when you explain it like that. Because you you mentioned briefly before, like if your definition of you is fun, you're a stand up comedian. That fits quite closely with what I like to see myself as. I started stand up two years ago, Dobbo, and I've become obsessed with it. But what's fascinated me about it is, uh, and I think you just explained it beautifully with the athlete example, is the pave to success in stand-up comedy, whatever that success looks like for you, is pretty much uh, for a lot of people, it's just keep bombing until you gradually bomb less and your bombs are less horrific. And then, you know what I mean? You gradually build up like that. Because the idea of going out um, you know, every a couple of times a week and just everyone's a home run, it's just, I've never heard anyone, whether it's sort of Dave Chappelle or Bill Burr or uh, Joe Rogan or whoever else you want to put in that category. No, I've never heard any of them say, yeah, I just, I just nailed my way to the top and never had a, it's all, oh, no, no, there was a lot of bombs. But like you say, if you've got, say, a thousand gigs over a three-year period 
and you know 200 of those need to be incredible for you to take the next step in your comedy it's so much more reasonable it's so much more uh, it sort of breaks it down into bite-sized chunks and i wish i wish someone had told me that when i was a runner because i think i went into each race going okay this is this is sort of the be all and end all if i want to make a breakthrough this is the day that it has to be which is it's probably not only highly unlikely but just adds a, a whole new element of of stress to what you're about to experience it's very difficult to truly find your own authentic goals because as soon as you're in a sport as soon as you're a runner say then somebody pulls you aside and said hey you should go and school cross country the school cross country and then someone else says hey there's a 5k run and you could be in the state team and they start putting these goals in front of you which if you didn't know about them you may not have chosen you might have just enjoyed running you didn't need to win a medal or compete and it, it, it's very difficult to get yourself out of the system to think about what your authentic vision and goals are for your running that you enjoy now, some people, what they tend to do is if they don't like pressure, then they pull away completely. I just run for me when the truth is they're dormant talent and somewhere inside them, they'd love to really compete. So that's when, you know, that's where the conversations I have is, well, how do we find a way for you to be loving this and to to, to tap into what you're really capable of and deliver on that and, and feel good about yourself? And a, a large part of that is, you know, am I happy with who I am? And, and you know, I'm happy with what I've done with my talent. That being that being said, what what's crucial is that we are making healthy conclusions. Like that's what I mentioned about people wanting to 10 X their business. There's this thing, when you look on social media, people just regurgitate bullshit cliches. And <laughs> if you look at me, I don't post anything on my social media because I posted what works. People wouldn't believe it. I get so much grief. I even had someone email me on my book. There's a, on my website, there's a book, the download is called goals. Apparently it's got a Trump reference in it. I don't remember that. So I'll have to go check and get rid of it. But, <laughs> but, um, Man, I had an email coming years ago. And the guy said, I came looking for elite strategies and I'm thinking it's a disgrace, the stuff that you write on your site and, and you know, because the book of goals, it says you don't need them. I said, they're mm. a very poor tool, actually. And he gave me such grief in this email. So I, I don't actually email people like that, but I emailed him back and said, mate, isn't it interesting that you came looking for elite strategies and when you found them, you didn't recognize them? Because I don't regurgitate the same shit. And so people need to before they assess, oh, I feel so bad about what I did in my life, you've got to really ponder if the mental distinctions of what you think is important, if it's accurate, you know, is this a true human way of looking at it? Is this, and for me as a coach, I've always got to work out how do things actually work? So if I don't understand how it works, I can't get the outcome. So sometimes people make these negative conclusions and they, and they say, yeah, I'm a failure because I didn't win Olympic medal. I'm a failure because I didn't win that race. I'm like, really? Like, we, a lot of my distinctions are helping people make accurate conclusions about the situation they're in so that if they deserve to feel pain that's appropriate but i also can avoid pain that is just invented because of a poor internal dialogue mm. it's interesting man like, i think the same argument can be made with with training like you look at the training of a bloke like steve monaghetti and it's not rocket science like you sit down and he walked us through his whole training program when he was here he said okay sunday was a two-hour run monday was two runs tuesday is a session and he walked it through and I think if you look at it on paper, you go, no, no, like, you, that's not going to make a difference. Like, you, how's that going to work? Like, it, it just looks too simple. And he says, yeah, yeah, but combine that with extreme talent, extreme consistency, and 25 plus years, and see where it takes you. And I thought, it's it's a brilliant way to put it. And, and I often think that as well. When I look at, like, if I read, uh, it, you know, if I'm, if I'm flicking through quotes, or if I'm reading something from Thich Nhat Hanh, who I love, I'm reading through like a Christian author or, or just any of the big religions when it's broken down and just boiled down into bite-sized chunks. A lot of it that's aimed to make a practical change to the way that you live your life does sound very simple. But when it comes to the application of that stuff, so often it's so so easy to jump past simple because you've you know you've set this illusion in your mind that uh, you know to to be happy or to be free or to enjoy your life or to reach your goals, you have to come across some secret ingredient where it's probably more a combination of what you were saying, like recognizing your skill set and then having a vision for your life, which is combined with, you know, the right work to get you there. Like, is that something that you wrestle with a lot? Because I think um, in the mindset scene, a lot of what I hear, it, it, there is a lot of cliche, as you say, mm. but a lot of the stuff, whether it's coming out of Buddhism or wherever, you go, hang on, that that sounds so simple that I don't even think I'm going to try it <laughs> because it can't possibly be that easy. 
hundred percent. So I, in my job, I can fix problems very quickly. Now, I think many people who are experiencing their role can. So often when people hire me as a, a consultant to their business, they say, how many hours you know, will I get? How many contact hours? How many times will, you, will I see you in, in, the, in the office? How am I? If I can fix your problem in just three minutes, do you do I need to be in the business all day? Like, you know, and so, but people want a report written. They want this complexity, but people make it complex or if it is complex, it's because they, when they don't understand it, but I can simplify things in my craft because I've done it so much and I really understand it. But, but people, even if you look online, if, if, uh, if I have a, if I did a free course on this, nobody would come. They just won't come. But if I have $20,000 course and all these modules and all, it's really complicated. People go, Oh, that, that's probably the one. But people think that the solution is complicated and it's not. So let me let me give you like clear right mental focus strategy right. So my mate, I, I come home to my house when I'm house sharing back years ago, and my best mate's walking out the door and he's on his mountain bike. It's night time. I'm like, what are you doing? And his name, my mate's name's Damon, and he says, I've got my first mountain bike race tonight. It was under light somewhere. And I said, no. And we were really close bunch of friends. I said, who's going to watch you? And he said, no one, no, no one. And I was devastated because I, like, I couldn't go. And I said, mate. Oh, wait. And I grabbed a, a marker, a permanent marker that just happened to be standing right there. And I drew three lines on his hand. And I just a, between his thumb and his finger, in his forefinger. And I said, mate, w we can't be there. But if we were, we would just be clapping like crazy. So when you see that, just remember, we're clapping, mate. Like, we just, I just didn't know. And it was a real awkward moment. And he's like, oh, all right. All right. All right. Thanks. So he goes out and I go to my function. And I come in late and he's in his pajamas sitting there having a huge bowl of pasta or something to recover. I said, how'd it go? He goes, oh my God. He goes, you guys never stopped clapping. <laughs> I said, you just clapped the whole race. <laughs> and I said, so what happened? He said, well, I was out in the front. He said, oh, I said, what's your first race? He goes, yeah, I just went because you guys were clapping. He said, I just kept on going. And I said, so, so what did you win? And he said, no, I took a wrong turn. I didn't know the course. <laughs> and he said, so everybody just went off without me. I said, so what happened next? He goes, well, you were still bloody clapping. So, I said, so I just got on. He goes, I caught all the way up. I said, you caught up. He said, I got in front again. And I said, so you did win. He said, no, I got tired. I came third. And so, so, I'm, so it's gold, right? So then about three weeks later, we're at a triathlon. Mm -hmm. And I see his best mate who's been in the triathlon. I rock up later. I bring the coffees and stuff. And he, he's, he's run across the line. And he's got three lines written on his, just on his hand. And somebody else says to him, I see it and I know what it's for. And, and uh, if someone else says, hey, mate, what are those three lines for? And he says, oh, it's something that Damon showed me. He said, I just, just imagine all the people would be clapping for me. And I just had it written on my hand and it bloody worked. He goes, I just felt great. So now if I, I could charge a fortune for that information, but it's too simple. No one wants it. No. But that's it. it. All we did is we chose what we want to think about instead. And you choose the thing that is joyful. So when people say they write their time on their hands, and it's not about putting something on the hand, it's about the joy. But the, the thing that, the reason we've got it on our hand or the reason we have a lucky handkerchief or something, that's the reminder of something. Because there's going to be other things that yell at us to focus on something else. You don't have enough breath. You know, your carbs are burning like hell. You know, you're completely desperate for the next, you know, the next uh, drink station. There's things screaming at you. So we need to decide what we want to think about instead, but it needs to be something joyful. So if you were to write down your time on your hand, if that feels like a burden day one, it doesn't, doesn't feel exciting. It doesn't make you a bit nervous, a bit excited. There's no joy. It will have no power. And it just so happened that we were a, lot, a good bunch of friends. And so that was a lot of joy for him. Um, so, and it's that elegant. It's that simple. It must be so frustrating. It must be so frustrating. It's such a funny question to be asked, like how many, and I didn't really even flinch when you, when you first made the, the statement of what an executive will say to you when you come into an office. You're like, yeah, no, that's about right. You want to see how much your value for money is. You're not thinking about the outcome as much as you're just thinking about the service, are you, in a lot of instances? And um, it, I, I can imagine that a lot of what you do say is it, it boils down to, you know, three lines in between your index finger and your thumb. Um, and, and like, what is it about people do you think that make them so hesitant to buy that simplicity? Is it just because 
they, they want to believe it's more difficult than, than what they had been told? Or like, have you got any opinions on why it is that we lean so much towards complex? I think it's safe because if it's complex, like at university, if I tick all the boxes and I do what they say, then I don't have to truly reflect. I can hide in the complexity. Mm. Uh, and Grant said to me the other day, he's like, oh, you're the velvet sledgehammer. He said, you'll, you'll punch me in the face and tell me what I need to know, but it doesn't leave a mark. Because he said, because it's, it's what I actually need to hear. And it's not always that, you know, but often people like Grant, they're desperate for solid, significant feedback that is helpful to the outcome. So I think people can hide in it. And I don't think they have to have really reflect whether or not they're really trying to achieve it. A lot of people are just, they're just going after things that society tells them that you should um, have a boyfriend or a girlfriend, or you should get a, uh, you should get a degree or, a, you know, you know, you should get a master's and then you, you should buy a house and then you should buy a, investment property and there's all these shoulds and i should get promoted even though if i got promoted i'd probably hate that job i don't think that people are consciously contemplating do i want this because when somebody wants it they're very open to the strategy they're desperate for it and i think many people are just trying to say do their job or uh just trying to i just like even when I went for a run, people would have given me strategies to say, be at my best, but I was never going to be at my best. I really enjoyed just, I just enjoyed running. It's so much so that I would run with my hands out like I was flying. They would just put them back. They went full out, just so I'm not a total dick, right? They went out like a Superman plane. They were more like, imagine if your arms were just dropped down by your side and you were going so fast, the wind would just pick them up a little bit and they'd just be back behind you a little bit. I used to just love the feeling of running. That's awesome. I just liked it. Someone said, you could go faster, you could do this time. I'm like, but why? <laughs> I just didn't want to. As long as you didn't start flapping. No, I was always conscious. When I went around the bend and then you could see people there, they always came down and I ran them next to them, you know, <laughs> like a normal person. But if I was on my own, I just wanted to fly. It just felt like when I was fit, I was just, oh my God, I felt like I could run forever. So I think that people don't always ponder what they're truly trying to achieve and therefore what's the key activity. Um yeah yeah Dubbo, it's a it's a good point man at the risk of uh, asking too broad a question this late in a podcast i, I wanted to throw this to you just because i'm curious to to know what you would say so obviously on the foundation of our life like say we have a vision for our life and we do take some time to establish all right what are we trying to achieve who do we want to be what are the words that describe us best like running or our sport might be one element of what we do on the foundation of our life or, or within that foundation so obviously the the rest of our life is going to make an impact on the way that we do actually perform in in that particular sport so if we're stressed mm. at home I often often notice and thank god i don't argue with my wife a lot because whenever i went to a or big fights i mean we might do petty stuff sometimes but yeah. if we ever had a good argument and then i had to go out and and train for whatever reason i just i could never run well when i was angry so i always noticed that like mm. there was one aspect of my life where for whatever reason, um, I didn't take any real deliberate strategies to improve it or, or whatever, apart from just trying to argue less, I would get out to the training track and be like, man, I'm just buggered before I even start. So I'm always curious to know about the impact that the other areas of our life, whether it's our work or our relationships, et cetera, have an impact on our performance in this one sport that we're trying to improve so rapidly. So if someone was looking at the foundation of their life and going, okay, like what do I need to smooth out? What do I need to... I feel like I'm making this complex in the setup to the question. Mm. Are there any simple strategies that people can apply to the foundation of their life beyond, all right, who am I trying to be that would make a almost immediate impact on their performance in the sport that they've chosen? In this case, running. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we do know those things influence it a hundred percent it influences. It. So the, I find that, there's a rule that is true that is how you do anything is how you do everything. So I'm a bit unorganized at home that I'll probably be a bit unorganized in my running. And if I don't deal with conflict well at work, I probably don't deal with conflict well at home or when I have to have a conversation with my kids. So let's just say conflict with my loved ones is very, or sometimes like conflict with loved ones is, is not difficult, but say maybe a difficult conversation at work is very difficult. 
then we can develop the skill of a difficult conversation in a non-threatening environment. Maybe I coach the kids' basketball team and I'll, I'll try to have a difficult conversation with one of those kids, not to be a bully or anything, but it's just a little bit, it's not as emotionally intense. And I need to learn a skill there. And once I've learned it, it will transfer everywhere in my life. So what we must do at that point, though, is we must reach out to someone who has the skill. And and then we must think, think about it like if I'm driving from my house to the shops and I always drive down the street and I always turn left and someone says to me, do you know you can get there if you turn right? Oh, really? So I drive to the shops and I get to the end of the street and I turn right, but I don't know the next move and the next move, so therefore I go back to my old way. So if I want to address something in my life, and let's say it's a difficult conversation, then I would need to phone someone who feels very comfortable with it and say, I need to have a different conversation with the kids at basketball because they all think they know that they get concerned about everyone not getting the same amount of time or something. And how would you do it? And I would take lessons from that person, but I wouldn't expect the lesson to work the first time. It's like driving mm. to the shops. And, I, and I'd say, all right, I'm going to try that and I'm going to tell you how it goes. I'm going to come back. And I'd try to learn it over multiple steps until I'd mastered it. And if you don't master it, then you haven't worked it out. Then just keep trying to master it. And once you master it, you will find that that will immediately be useful in all other areas of your life. Whether that be having a tidy house or, or whether it be saving money. What, so that, that's, that, and that's something that um, I'm often guiding you know, my clients through. Yeah. Like the other things that are, yeah, we, we perform better if our house is in order. That's the way I always language it. Is your house in order? That's a good point. It's a really good point. Speaking about house in order, I've been admiring the uh, bookshelf at the back of your house and thinking during this podcast that I'm going to have to make some adjustments to my, to my own because this blank wall has started to, to look a little bit bare. Um, what do you what do you got back there? It looks like that each of those items have some significance. I think I'm seeing an Olympic bronze medal. There's yeah, a biggie, there is biggie smalls metal. as well. There's a lantern, footy. Yeah, there's a. Uh, this is these are. Yeah, the, so somebody said to me once, Dubbo, you got a really interesting job, but you got a shit office." I like and, it. And uh, <laughs> yeah, well now and now you do. But they were oh, I thought they were referring to this office you have now. Sorry. No, yes. No, no. And so what happened? Because I've never valued that sort of stuff. Mm. And also, when you have a significant conversation with somebody, you help somebody. There's not always something to show for it. Like anyway, so. <laughs> Uh, like oh, anyway, so yeah, this is uh, Matt Target's Olympic bronze medal, and he um, uh, that's a hell of a story. And because uh, he wasn't meant to be in that race, they moved him from one race to another, and we he missed out on a, a gold. And then next thing you knew, we're in this race. So it's a story for another day. But as a gift, as a say thank you, uh, <sighs> that lives with me. That's quite a gift, isn't it? That is. Um, really I was very lucky good. recently too. Grant said to me, if you ever want to borrow any of my medals, you're welcome to. I was like, oh, sure. So Grant just gave me a bag. He gave me a bag. I swear to God, true, a Versace bag with all these gold medals and silver medals from Athens. Um, was it oh, Beijing? my gosh. Like, and I was like, I just, I got Grant Hackett's medals in my um, <laughs> Hope no robbers are listening to this back. podcast, Dobbo. Nah, well, they're not here anymore, guys. And, uh, this has got some serious security in this house now. But uh, also at the back there, there's a poster from um, Colby West. He's a pro skier that I was advising, and we won medals at uh, multiple X Games, the US Big Air Championship. So there's a poster of him and signed at the top right there. There's an artist that I've helped develop her career, and uh, she's just is absolutely crushing it. Went from being a graphic designer, having this passion for you know prints and imagery, and said, is this possible? And we're like, yeah, that worked. And then there's some other medals and random events like this is an interesting one this is a spoon the school I spoke at and they they give you a spoon and uh to say thanks and at first I I got a spoon I was like oh. I thought like, oh thanks guys and, and everybody sort of groaned as if I did and then I realized the spoon's really important so the next time I spoke at that school I they gave me a spoon apparently really hard to get there's people that have been trying the whole life to get one so I held it up like I just won the world championships like yeah and they're great they're like yeah <laughs> shit um so, and there's a, no, I was, there's a manager of Australian kayak team when I uh, went to oh, Norway many years ago. So there's a hat from that. And look, there's a lot of football from North Melbourne Football Club. What's the Disney uh, book, Dobbo? Yeah, there's a lot of, I'm a massive Disney fan. I'm Are a you? massive Walt Disney fan. Oh, Walt Disney was a absolute freak. He invented stereo sound. He invented voice. He took, put voice onto the, uh, onto a moving cartoon, the feature length film. He, he, 
what he did in a lifetime is nuts. I, I've read a, a couple of autobiographies with him. There's one of them I've read about 20 times. Anytime I'm stuck, I go back and look at how he handled the development of the Disney company. And uh, people, some people don't like how cliche it is. But that's irrelevant. Every single person on the planet knows who Mickey Mouse is. Like, even kids, there's Mickey Mouse is not even on TV as a cartoon anymore, and the kids still know who Mickey Mouse is. <laughs> Uh, it's so, so what's um, the book called yeah so that's the oh that one there is uh it's just a, a story of this the story of the studio that one oh, oh the one yeah. i've read a lot of time is how to be like walt um which is up there somewhere unless it's oh yeah walt disney how to be like walt awesome i might have to check it out yeah so um i, I like the audiobook so yeah there's lots back there and um these are my yeah this is marcus and uh, yeah, so there you go. And also, I do a lot of keynotes from here. So during lockdown, I'll, I'll present from here. Don't worry, so, that's, that's awesome, man. So, it, a... so we're probably coming to the end, are we? I'm more than happy to. Uh, ha, ha, I hope that's enough for you guys. And if oh, I can man. reach out again. No, that was that was unreal. I uh, I really enjoyed it, man. I'll, I'll...